Good evening to every one of you that are tuning in, whether you be live or whether uh, you're tuning in at a, at a later time. I uh, just want to take a moment before we get started and to tell you thank you for being with us on this good Friday evening worship gathering that we have for you online. Um, this, is a, this is a really monumental celebration day for the church. And to be honest with you, it's not even just for the church. It's for those of you maybe that are watching that you don't go to church. Maybe you're not a follower of Jesus. Um, this is like the most monumental day for all of us. Um, and so our prayer is tonight that as we gather together for these few minutes that we will take time out of our busy schedule tonight and we will focus and celebrate and worship and praise that we will listen to what God is saying to us tonight and that we will respond to him in whatever way is appropriate for you. You know, I know that you're not in person with us and that's okay uh, because God has this little attribute that we like to celebrate sometimes called omnipresence. And it means that he's everywhere at all places all the time. Uh, and so that lets us know that, hey, if he's right where we are, that he's also right where you are. And whatever it is that God wants to do in your life tonight, he can do it if you will make availability for him. Um, so again, as, as we're gonna sing songs and we're gonna get into the story of the crucifixion, I just want you to be responsive, not to us, because we can't even see you. We can't hear your voice as you sing or as you respond, however it is that you respond, but he can. So don't respond to us tonight, just be responders to him. Make yourself available to him tonight. And so what I want to do is I wanna open in prayer tonight um, and let's kick this thing off. And I'm just gonna be very honest with you right now. This is not just a prayer I'm doing to be a formality as we gather together. This actually is a prayer from the bottom of my heart that on this Good Friday, that God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, that they might touch you right where you are. So let's pray this evening. Father, we love you. And we are so grateful for the cross. As we gather together tonight to celebrate what you accomplished as you gave your life for all of us. It, it does not matter who it is that's watching, who it is that's listening right now. You gave it for all of us. And I pray tonight, Father, that you would move in the lives of men and women, sons and daughters, mothers and fathers, husbands and wives, grandmothers, grandfathers, God, everyone that is tuned in right now, I ask, God, that they would take one moment right now and just say, I invite you, Jesus, into this space to move in my life. And I invite you not only to move as I want you to move, because that's the way that we normally pray that. I want you to move how I want you to move. But on tonight, as I think about what you gave for me and what you laid down for my life, I take a moment and I set myself to the side and I focus completely on you and I ask tonight, Jesus, that you would do in me what you desire to do in me and that we would never be the same again. We lift up your name, we praise you, we worship you right now. And we do pray it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen, amen, and amen. And so right now what we're gonna do um, is we're going to go into a time of worship. And again, we invite you to engage. Engage with us right now because he is worthy of all the worship that we could ever give to him. I'll be back with you guys in just a moment.
Again, um, I know I've already welcomed you one time, but I do want to just tell you again, thank you so much for being with us on this Good Friday. Um, Good Friday is one of those days that it's, it's, it's kind of an oddity to say that we celebrate it because it is considered to be one of the darkest days in human history. I mean, we're going to celebrate uh, one of the ugliest murders slash executions, however you would like to label it. Um, it is one of the ugliest ones in the history of humanity. And not only was it ugly because of the way that it was performed, it was ugly because it was performed on someone that was perfect. He was perfect love. But we are going to celebrate that tonight because it's not only about the darkness. The, the most incredible thing about the work of Jesus on the cross is how he takes beauty from ashes, as the Bible says, that he can take the darkest moments um, in our lives and this being the darkest moment and he can bring something so incredible out of it. And that's what we're here to celebrate tonight is what is what he brought out of this story that we call the crucifixion story. And we're going to look at the whole story. But but I, I, as I was thinking about this year, and I know it's, it's kind of crazy because I'm actually using the same line that I used last Good Friday as we talk about this, this line out of the book of John that we're going to get to in just a moment. It's the same thing I preached out of, but I'm bringing it in a completely different way, a uh, completely different perspective tonight. Um, but, but I want to talk to you tonight about the finish line because I think sometimes when we think about the crucifixion, um, we think that the crucifixion is this isolated event. It is this moment. It is a singular place in time that tells this story and shows this story. But, but if you'll really look at the crucifixion for what it is, you'll actually see that the crucifixion is a part of a bigger story. Um, it is not an isolated event. In fact, if I could describe it this way to you tonight, the, the crucifixion is the finish line for a work that started over a thousand years before it took place, um, we can look all throughout Scripture and we can see that this was all a part of God's perfect plan um, of restoration, of redemption. All of these words we celebrate in the church that we, uh, there are all these churchy words. All of these things are a part of not just a moment, not an isolated event, but a race that was run 
um, throughout the history of humanity, as we look back and we can see uh, God's love and care and action in the history of humanity, um, we see it when he created humanity. We see that God spoke everything else into existence, but when it came to um, us, he did not speak us into existence. The Bible actually says he reached down into the dust, and it's actually really good right now because we are uh, on a dust floor, and you can see right here the dust that is falling down right now, that that's exactly what God did. He reached down into the dust, and he formed us with his hands, showing us that he, in the very beginning, established a very unique relationship between humanity and himself, between you and I and him. It wasn't established at the crucifixion. He showed his love for us all the way back in creation. And then we see God shows his mercy again when Adam and Eve fall. Um, and he could have shut it all down. He could have said, you know what, we failed, we messed up. Adam and Eve, uh, they, met, they, they ate the fruit, and, and God could have just shut the whole project down. But he didn't do it. The Bible says that even then, he was already orchestrating a plan to redeem humanity into perfect relationship with him, into perfect standing with him. And we see that, that he didn't kill Adam and Eve in the moment and then shut down the creation. But it says that after they fail, that God began to speak again. And as he spoke, he spoke of promise and restoration about the one that would come that would strike the head of the enemy with his heel. And it was speaking of Jesus. We see the, the love and, and uh, desire for God to restore humanity to continue throughout the book of Genesis, such as when uh, the earth had gotten so evil and the days had become so evil that, that God said, you know what, I'm going to send a flood to, to purge the earth. But, but it wasn't to, to kill people. That was not the point. It was not to harm people because God's plan the entire time was a way of salvation. And he made a way, um, and it just so happened that only a few people took advantage um, of a way that was made. But, but we see that Noah builds an ark, and God gives them a way out. Why? Because he loves us, and he wants a relationship with us. We see, um, again, the faithfulness of God as it goes from generation to generation. And there are these promises that are poured out, such as the one that was poured out to Abraham. And then it didn't end with Abraham, but it goes to Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, and it goes all the way down. And we can see that God remains faithful as he moves in humanity. We can see God show up yet again when Israel is in captivity in Egypt. And um, Egypt is, is got the um, got their hands hard on the Israelites, and they are, he, the Egyptians are pressing them down, and God hears their cries, and he sends Moses to save them, and he sends all of those miracles. Why? Because God loves humanity, and God is here to restore and to do a work. This is all part of the race. We can see God continue to move in their lives when, when Moses didn't send them, take them into the promised land. So what did God do? God, he brought up a new generation in Joshua and Caleb that he would take them in. He didn't let them die without the promise God had given to Abraham years before. But he said, I'm going to continue to show my love. We see God continue to move in humanity with the lives of people uh, that we call judges like Samson and Deborah. We see God show up in individuals' lives uh, to show his love to them. We see the story of Hosea and Gomer or being an, uh, an expression of God's love. We see the story of Ruth, this, this woman who was from Moab, and God rescued her and brought her into Boaz's field and blessed her with such an ex extravagant life, with extravagant love, because God loves humanity. We see yet again God show up um, in individuals where he was bringing protection to them, people like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, as they were thrown into the fiery furnace, people like um, Daniel, who were who he was thrown into the lion's den, even though he had been serving Nebuchadnezzar faithfully, uh, he was thrown into that lion den and God rescued him. We can see the beautiful love story of God through blessings like that of Manasseh and Ephraim, where the father crossed his arms and he blessed the one that did not deserve it, being an expression again of God's love. We see God show up through the prophets of the Old Testament, men and women like Elijah and Elisha and uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah. These great prophets coming in times where they were in exile and it looked like things couldn't get any worse, but God's love showed up and it was God's word that brought them out of exile. It was God's love that brought them out of exile. And I could go on and on, but I'm going to stop right there. And I just want to remind you today that this has been a race that has been going for a long time until what we call Good Friday. 
And now we find ourselves in the last leg of that race. And Jesus is born and Jesus lives 33 years. And while he's on earth, he does all of these amazing things. He heals the sick. He raises the dead. He, uh, he makes the lame walk. He, he casts out demons. Um, all of these amazing things. And while all of those assignments are incredible and beautiful, that still wasn't the finish line for Jesus. I mean, that would have been, I almost want to say that would have been enough because, I mean, look at all the great things that Jesus did to show yet again God's love for humanity. But there was this finish line, um, an ultimate destiny, an ultimate assignment, if you will. And Hebrews chapter 12 tells us that for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the the cross. It was for the joy set before him. Do you know what the joy set before Jesus was that helped him run this race, that helped him run with endurance? Do you know what the joy set before him was? Can I tell you what it was? It was you and it was me. That he was thinking of us. He was thinking of you. If you're watching right now and you don't even know if God loves you, I'm here to tell you that it was his love for you as he was looking at you and he was watching you and he was thinking about you. It was you that was on his mind and his heart and that you were the joy that was set before him. You were the one, I I don't know if you've ever been in a race before, but they always tell you that to finish your race strong, what you have to learn to do is you have to keep your eyes on the finish line. You never take your eyes off of the finish line, off and put them on the op- opponents or the fans or anything. You keep it on the finish line. And that's exactly what Jesus did. And you were that finish line. This moment that we celebrate today was the finish line. You were the joy that helps him endure the most painful and excruciating thing that has ever been. And I want to walk you through just what that day look like. I'm not going to read all of the passages. You can go back and read all of these. I'm going to give you the the passages that you can go back and read, but I do want to share this story with you. It all started when Jesus came in in Mark 11, and he made what we would call the the, the triumphant entry. As he came in, we we call that day Palm Sunday, as he came in as king, Um, and you can go and you can read about that. And then from there, he has this week that he stays in Jerusalem, and we get to the end of the week all the way to Thursday, you can go to Mark 14 and you can read about that Thursday and about the dinner that took place that day as Jesus sat down at the table with his disciples and they had a meal and they began to eat together. And then from the dinner as he served that first communion, as we call it, and we're going to take that at the end, but, but he served that first communion. It was there that he told them about his body being broken for them, that it was about the new cup that they would be able to drink of, and all of that is so meaningful, but that's just a part of the race that still wasn't the finish line. Then we get to the garden in Luke chapter 22, where Jesus goes in to pray, and he even takes some of the disciples in with him, and the Bible says he began to pray a prayer that was so intense that blood drops began to drop out of his forehead because he was praying with such intensity. And he was telling the Lord that although this was scary, although this did not look appealing to him, he was still thinking of you and he was still thinking of me because he told the Father, he said, not my will, but thy will be done. I will I will take this cup if I have to drink of this cup. And he did that in the garden. Um, and then after he gets done praying, you remember at the end of Luke 22, Judas, one of his dearest friends, one of the 12 disciples, he brings Jesus, uh, he brings brings the soldiers uh, of the Roman army in to where Jesus is praying in the garden and they arrest Jesus. And yet again, we see Jesus' love because Peter takes out a sword and he chops the guy's ear off. We don't know if he was just a bad aim um, or if he was that good that he didn't want to kill the guy, but he cut his ear off. But at any event, Jesus reaches down and takes the man's ear and he puts it back on that even in the most excruciating moment of Jesus' life where he was praying to the point where blood was spilling out of his head, he was still showing his love for people. He was still expressing the love of God for humanity as he healed that soldier that night. And then after that happened, we keep reading in Luke chapter 22, and they they seized him um, and they took him away. And at 6 a.m. on Friday morning, they took him before Pilate and they had this conversation with Pilate. And you could tell that Pilate wasn't really wanting to execute him. That wasn't his plan. But he was having all of this pressure from the religious people, from the governors that were around the other cities and they were telling Pilate, this is a man that claims to be a king. And he was asking Pilate, I mean, Pilate was asking Jesus, do you claim to be a king? And they had this whole
whole conversation. And at 6 a.m., they, after they had this conversation, you know, they, they sentenced Jesus to go and to be flogged. And at 8 a.m., uh, Jesus is led um, to the place of the flogging. And if you go to Israel today, they have a place called the Great Pit where they believe this flogging took place. And one of the most humbling experiences that I've personally ever had was when I was down in that pit. And there was a, there's a post there uh, where there were many posts. And they said one of these posts could have very well been the post that they tied Jesus to when the Bible tells us they beat him beyond recognition. Um, and I just began to weep and cry. And we sang um, in that pit that day in Israel, I exalt thee. And, and I don't think I've ever sang that song with that type of um, a, a amazement and thanksgiving at what Jesus had done for me because that was where in Matthew chapter number 27 that they flogged Jesus um, and they beat him beyond recognition. Then we get to 9 a.m. and we see this is kind of where in Luke 23 um, that the crucifixion actually begins um, at Golgotha, the place of the skull um, where they crucified him. They nailed him um, to a cross um, and you can read all of these amazing things um, that tell about how um, atrocious the Romans had made crucifixion, that they had, they celebrated the fact that they had created this awful, awful death that would be so painful and so ugly. Um, they, they celebrated that. And Jesus said, nobody took my life, but I gave it. He said, I hung on that cross, not because anybody made me do it. I hung on that cross because I chose to do it for you. Um, he chose to do it for me. And then at 12 noon, they finished this crucifixion process. And from 12 noon to 3 p.m., Jesus hung on that cross where you can read stories where people would tell about um, how they would beat you in such a way that your, your lungs and your ribs were completely exposed um, and that breathing as you were hanging there became harder and harder. And you would actually have to take your feet and you would have to press down into those nails and dig those nails into your feet and hands to lift yourself up just to get a gasp of air just to breathe. And he did that for three hours, the story tells us. And then at three o'clock PM in John chapter 19, and this is, um, I mean, in John chapter 19, this is where we pick up our story. In John chapter 19, it says, later knowing that everything had now been finished and the scripture and that the scripture would be fulfilled. Jesus said to them, he says, I'm thirsty. And he's been hanging there for three hours. He's been going through this process for nine hours, 12 hours, somewhere in that neighborhood. And he says, this is it. He says, I'm thirsty. And in John chapter 19, verse 29, it says a jar of wine vinegar was there. So they soaked a sponge in. Uh, they, they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk with the wine vinegar on it. And with the hyssop plant, they lifted it up to Jesus' lips. And when he had received the drink, that's when we read these words that I want to talk to you about, the finish line. You can just hear his heart beating. Those last few seconds, you can picture seeing his lungs inflating and deflating with, with air and oxygen. And those last moments, they raised the stalk of the hyssop plant with the sponge filled with wine vinegar, it says, and when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. These three words that we read here, there are no greater three words ever spoken in the history of mankind these three words are incredible. The Bible says that he, he cried out, and it's the word kradzo. And I, I, I've, I've told people this before, but maybe you don't know. This is a very specific word. It means to speak loudly with everything that you have. It's only used in the Bible two times in the New Testament. So we know that when Jesus spoke it, he didn't whisper it. He didn't say it timidly. But, but we know that he yelled out as loud as he possibly could, It is finished! And he screamed it out. He wanted everybody to hear it. He wanted those crucifying him to hear him say it's finished because he loved them. 
He wanted those that served him and walked away from him and maybe were standing at a distance because we know the disciples weren't at the cross. But maybe they were within crying distance where if Jesus yelled out enough that while Peter had denied him, maybe, just maybe, Peter, even where he is, could hear, it is finished as Jesus yelled it out so that he could know, Peter, I still love you and I did this for you. Maybe even Judas so that Judas would know that there was a work that was completed. He wanted, I believe, every demon in hell, every devil, every dark principality to hear these three words, it is finished. Three of the most powerful words ever spoken. But I want to break it down as we look at the finish line real quick. I just want to take a few moments and I just want to break this down because it's three words, which is crazy to me when you think, that here's this, here's this God hanging on this cross and he gets to give these last words and he can finish the whole thing. He brings completion to the work that started all the way back in Genesis, all the way back then. He finishes it with three words. I, I call them the three words of authority that Jesus spoke. So let's break them down. The first one he says, number one, it. That, that doesn't sound like a very significant word, but, but I think the word it is extremely significant because here's what I know. Every one of us has an it. I don't, I don't know what your it is, but we all have that it. We all have something in our life that needs to be touched, transformed by God, moved by God, changed by God, whatever word you want to use there. Uh, I love the fact that Jesus doesn't limit it to one thing. He doesn't say salvation is finished. He doesn't say forgiveness is finished. He doesn't say that um, my love is finished. He, he, he gives it a very simple pronoun, it, it, because there's a lot of it's out there and whatever your it is, you can actually fill in the blank. What is your it? Because I'm here to tell you today that Jesus conquered your it. You know, it's funny, Jesus spoke three words, it is finished on the cross. And that was the completion of Jesus using those three words. That, that was it, that, that meant it was done. And we're gonna talk about the word finished in a moment. But I was thinking, you know, it's crazy because this isn't the only time that Jesus spoke three powerful words. And I think that throughout the life of Jesus, if we'll look back, we'll actually see that he would speak three words over and over again. And I think each time that he spoke three words that we go back and we read it, it was a prophetic word prefacing this moment, these three words, letting you know, hey, there are a lot of it's that need to be conquered. And Jesus wanted us to know I'm conquering it all. Let, let, let me just take you through a few of them. Check this out. I think this is very powerful. It, it starts all the way back in Genesis chapter one. In, in the beginning, uh, according to the book of John, the, the Bible says in John 1, what? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, letting us know that all the way back at creation, Jesus was there, and He was the Word. That's the way it describes Him. He was the Word. Do you remember the Word that God gave in Genesis chapter 1 when He created? What did He say? Let there be. That was, those weren't just words God said. That was Jesus showing up in a three-word proclamation, just like when he said, it is finished. And he wanted us to know that whatever the, says, whatever the word says is, and that nothing can stop it. We can go into the life of Jesus, the human life of Jesus, and we can see three words would continue. Do you remember the moment where Jesus was descending down from the mountain where he had, he had taught the disciples how to pray, and he was met there by a man with leprosy? Do you remember that? And Jesus reached out his hand, and he touched the man with leprosy. And what did he say to that man? He said, be made clean. Three words. Letting us know that, that I know Jesus was healing a man of a physical sickness, but those words that he spoke there had an underlying message because they believed that these types of infirmities, that they came from sin. I mean, you can read that this was their theology all throughout. So when Jesus healed this man of leprosy, he wasn't just saying that, that the it is your healing of leprosy. He was actually talking on a much deeper level to say all the sins that mankind has 
I've got it covered. I bring a cleansing to those things. In fact, doesn't Hebrews chapter 9 verse 24 tell us about the atonement of sins when it says, So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many? Three words. Be made clean. And just maybe that's your it today. Maybe your it is be made clean. That's your three words. You've got sin. Yeah, we all do. And Jesus came to overcome and to defeat sin. That's an it. We see another it. When, when Jesus was out on the lake, you remember that the disciples fell asleep in the bottom of the boat and the disciples were afraid of the storm and they thought the storm was going to kill them. What did Jesus say? He said what? Peace be still. Three words. So maybe your it, just like them, is the chaos and the storms that you think are going to take your life. I've got good news for you. Jesus said it is finished. And so those storms, those chaotic moments, those things that are coming against you, I want you to know that he's already overcome them. That's an it. So I will say to you the same thing that Jesus said to them. Peace be still. Here's another it that I read about. Remember when the woman... Um, that had the issue of blood came to Jesus. And this is a story that I could take all night and tell because it's one of the most moving stories. But to keep it short, this woman had been sick for 12 years. She was bleeding to death. Uh, she had given everything that she had, all the money she had to find healing. She couldn't find healing. And she, she saw Jesus was coming. And so she made up in her mind, she says, I've got to get to Jesus. And this was breaking every law there was to break. It was breaking the Roman law. It was breaking the Jewish law. And maybe most importantly, it was breaking the, breaking the religious law. Think about that. This woman was breaking the religious law as she was unclean and she crawled to Jesus to touch him and she had no right to do that. But when she touched him, there were three words that were spoken. Do you remember what was spoken? He said, who touched me? Because you see, that's one of our it's. The Bible says in Hebrews that we do not have a high priest that cannot be touched by our infirmities. Prefacing the it on the cross, Jesus had a moment where he said, listen, I'm giving you full access to me. You can go read Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, where it says, now we have confidence that we can enter the most holy place, that we can boldly come to the throne of grace. Do you remember on Good Friday that when Jesus gave up his spirit, an earthquake hit the earth and it ripped the veil in the tabernacle from top to bottom. It ripped it so there would be full access into the holy of holies, something that has never been accessible in the history of humanity. God finished it so that you and I might be able to look back. And when Jesus said, who touched me? He was really not not saying who touched me he was trying to bring attention to everyone around him that even this unclean woman that law and tradition and religion said had no right to touch me I am making a way for them to touch me so that if you feel isolated and alone from God right now your it is conquered you're not isolated. You're not alone. He has made a way. And then after that, he gives three more words. Those aren't the only three words he gave her. That after he saw her and he said, your faith has healed you. This is what he told her. He said, go in peace. Saying that, listen, it's, it's, it's bigger than just your physical healing. If this is your moment to be made whole. The word peace there, the word shalom. Very different word uh, meaning and context than when he spoke peace to the storm. The word shalom that he spoke over the woman with the issue of blood meant you can be made whole. And it takes me back to Isaiah 53 where he says that he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought, brought peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. That peace that was on him, it's a wholeness letting us know that he doesn't just forgive our sins but he heals our iniquities. He heals our diseases. He is a healer. I don't know if you know that. If that's your it, that's one of the things that he does with the woman with the issue of blood. That's what he talks about in Isaiah 53, that one of the it's is physical illness, or maybe it's iniquity. Maybe it's something that makes you unclean, but I'm here to tell you that you have that it conquered today. I hope you're getting this. I think this is some amazing stuff. One more. I, I've got others I could do. I'm going to do one more. What about this one? Do you remember the three words that were spoken when Jesus attended a homegoing service of one of his best friends? And those sisters were brokenhearted. Those disciples didn't understand why Jesus didn't show up. And Lazarus died. And Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. Four days in the tomb. The Bible, I love the King James Version. It says, he stinketh. <laughs> he had been in there that long that, that 
Four days was too long for God to do anything. And I don't know if you remember, Jesus ends up speaking three words. Lazarus, come forth. That's all he spoke. And out of that, we see that Jesus is the resurrection, that if you're it, if something is dying and something is dead in your life, I'm here to tell you that Jesus is the resurrection. Jesus is the resurrection. He conquered it. So whatever it is that you think is dead or dying in your life, I'm here to tell you that he came, according to John 10, 10, not only to give us life, but to give us life abundant, abundant life, life to the full. He is the resurrection. And maybe your it is some things are dying. And he says, Lazarus, come forth. Or you use your name, whatever your name is, speak it over yourself right now. John, come forth, and he will bring life back into you. So there's an it for all of us. Every one of us have an it. What is yours? Because he conquered it. The second word is the word is. The word is is the tense or the phrase. This word shows that this is a right now word that is applicable every single moment of every day. Is is the state of your problem, your struggle, your issue. Yeah, it is. But the state of Jesus answering whatever it is in your life is also the word is. It is taken care of. It is right now. There is no delay. There is no deny. There is no interfering. There is no hindering. There is no blockage to what God wants to do because it is. That tense is in very important that, yeah, you have an it, but I'm here to tell you that it is taken care of right now. It is not a past tense thing because some of you think that God is a past kind of God, that you have God, you've had God move in your past, you've seen God do great things in your past, but you've, you, you're looking back to that thinking, I've had the best of what God has to offer, but God says, you get to go, go from glory to glory, from grace to grace, and God says, no, 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 it is right now, it not, not was, it is right now, and you need to get a hold of this for your life, and it's not one day, it's not a tomorrow work, there are people that I talk to all the time, that they look at tomorrow, and they think, Man, one day, one day God will, will, will do something. You know, that, that people are waiting on something. They're either waiting on one of two things in my experience. They're either waiting on Jesus to return or they're waiting for themselves just to go to heaven before Jesus returns. And that's the way they talk. That's the way they live their life. But the Bible says that the kingdom of God is at hand. And I'm here to tell you, it is right now. So don't miss the present moment of what God wants to do. And the third word is this. The third word is this. Finished. Finished. Say that with me. Just say finished. This word that, that he spoke is, is a very powerful Greek word. It's, it's the, the word tetelestai. And, and this word was used in various everyday uses and, and by different people. You could see a lot of different contexts. A servant, as they were doing um, a job for their master, w- w- would say, I've completed the work that is assigned to me. In fact, that's the way Jesus used this word in John 17, where he told the father, he says, listen, I've completed the work that you have for me. When a priest would examine uh, a sacrifice to make sure the sacrifice was acceptable, and you have to understand that for Jesus to overcome all the world's sin, for all of humanity and all of history, he had to be a spotless lamb. And so when the priest would, would, would examine the animal before sacrifice, if the animal was good enough for sacrifice, and they would call it faultless, although there was nothing faultless, Jesus is the un- only faultless one. They would use that word tetelestai. So we know that when Jesus died for us, he was the perfect faultless lamb. We also know that it was used um, in the perfect tense. It means it is finished. It stands finished. It will always be finished because the most meaningful usage of the word tetelestai was the word that was used by merchants. That would mean the debt is paid in full, that everything that needed to be paid was paid, that everything that was demanded by the holiness of God, it has been paid in the person of Jesus Christ. That means everything that God could ever want to do for you, everything that God could ever want want to do for me. It stands completed. There is nothing else that we could possibly do. It, whatever your it is, is right now. Jesus says, I've done everything that could ever be done to make a way of victory for you in your life. The last thing I want to tell you, then we're done. Number four, His finish line is actually my starting post. (laughs) 
The finished work of Jesus is actually my starting place. Think about that with me for a moment, because this is what so many people think. This is the way so many people live their lives with Jesus. They think they have to start the race over. That's what so many think they have to do. That's what so many preachers teach. They think that it's your job to start the race. And and, and it's so funny because it's the opposite of what the Bible teaches us. We, we think according to man, and when we think as man trying to think upwards, but, but what we have to do is we have to think like God thinks downwards, and the reality is God's reality is different than my reality. God's reality is this, you are complete in Christ. Listen to this, Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, for in him dwells all the fullness of, God, of the Godhead bodily. This is talking about Jesus, and you are complete in him. I'm going to say that again, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Listen to me. If nobody's ever told you this, you are complete in Christ. You are complete in Christ. Now run in your completeness. You don't have to start at the starting line. You get to start at the finish line. That starting post for you is where Jesus ended up and said, I have brought completion in your life. I have already crossed the finish line for you. Now you get to just run in completeness. Your completion is so complete. Listen to me. That he made you a son. He made you a daughter. And this is what people think. People think when I fall, I become incomplete. No, no, no. When you fall, you did not become incomplete because it was not your work that made you complete in the first place. It was the finished work of Jesus that made you complete. You need to know right now that you are complete in him. You are complete in him. Everything he won at the finish line When he says it is finished, that's the finish line. Everything that he won is yours. And it's not just yours, but it's your starting point. You don't have to go back and earn it. You don't have to go back and work your way to it. He brought completion to you. So my prayer today is that on this Good Friday, that you will run the race from the finish line. Don't try to start it over. You're wasting time. You're wasting energy. You're wasting breath. But if you'll pick up where Jesus' finish line was when he said, it is finished. And I gave you some examples of what those it's were. Those are just a few of the examples. I could give you more than that. But you now know that there is a Uh, There's a trophy that has been won for you and for me that we get to start running this race from the finish line. So my prayer for you today is that you would run the race in the completeness that Jesus has for you. I want to pray for you. Um, I want to ask that if you're here and you don't know Jesus, if there's some way that you'll let us know down below. If you'll comment tonight and just say, hey, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you don't feel complete. Maybe you're here and you have an it and you want to call it out by name. I I invite you to do that right now so that we could pray with you for it, whatever it may be. We invite you to respond now in this moment. And we're going to be praying with you and we're going to even be chatting with you as this is going on. So you're not going to be just writing something and being alone. We're going to pray with you in this moment. But I'm going to play a corporate prayer right now for us that we would be, uh, that we would find our completeness in Christ right now, that we would uh, run the race that is set before us from Christ's finish line and that whatever it is, that we would know that it is finished right now. So Father, I thank you tonight for this time that we have together. I thank you that that on this Good Friday that we're able to get together and celebrate the person of Jesus, what he accomplished on the cross of Calvary, that those last three words that he spoke, that they call it the sixth saying of Jesus, it is finished. That whatever it is for them, God, that they will call it out by name right now, and they they would know that there is no it that you did not overcome. They can fill in the blank. If they need healing, you gave them healing. If they need deliverance, you gave them deliverance. If if they need forgiveness of sins, you gave them forgiveness of sins. If they need boldness, you gave them boldness. If they need purity, God, you're a purifying God. Whatever it is that they need. But I pray they would call that it right now. And they would know that it is right now. And I pray they would pray a prayer. Not saying I'm waiting and I'm looking forward to it. But I pray they would change their language right now. And they would say right now it is. 
It is overcome. It is conquered. It is won. And I pray right now for the finished work of Jesus, that that completeness in Christ, that every person under the sound of my voice, that they might walk and run this race that has been set before them, not from the starting line. Jesus already did it. All we have to do is pick up with the trophy that Jesus left, and we get to do the victory lap. Come on, somebody. That's what we get to do. We get to be the ones right now in Jesus' name that complete the victory lap of what Jesus has already completed. It's not my race to run. It was Jesus' race to run. Now I pick up my completeness in Christ. They pick up right now their completeness in Christ that they may take that victory lap through the remainder of their life on this earth. You have won it all for us, and we say thank you, and we choose now to walk in the finished work of Jesus. I am complete in him. Say it with me. I am complete in him. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Amen. Before you go tonight, I want to take a moment, and I want to in invite you to take communion with us. This is the last thing we're going to do. Um, if you're at home or if you're out in a hotel room traveling for spring break, whatever, you can go find a Ritz cracker, whatever you got sitting around. I don't care. Uh, go get a Coke Zero, whatever it is that, that you want to drink, and just take it out and just say that these are the things that I'm celebrating and I'm remembering today. We, we, it would not be a complete Good Friday experience if we didn't take a moment and celebrate communion together and remember the body and the blood of Jesus. So if you would, go get that. Um, and if you need to just hit pause, I'm going to keep going. But you can pause it, and then you can just do it with me if you want, however you want to do it. But we hold up the body of Christ right now, if you would. Take Take the body in your hand. This was the body that was broken for you. This was the body that took those wounds, that took those uh, stripes for your healing, and we celebrate it right now in Jesus' name. We thank you for the body that was broken for us. We lift this up in remembrance of you. God, you said that when we do this, we do this in remembrance of you, that we get to walk in the victory of everything that it brought. This represents the finished work, and I'm taking it because I am complete in you, and I have been given everything that you've won in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you could, would you take the blood? Again, whatever you have to work with, this is the blood of the new covenant. We hold it up right now and we pray in Jesus' name, God, that you will take the blood and apply it to our life. The blood of the new covenant, the blood that washes away all my sins, the blood that has so much power. As we think about the new covenant, that's the new relationship, the new life, the new love, the new kindness of God that we get to walk in as New Testament believers. We celebrate the blood. Without the blood, there is no atonement of sin. Jesus, you are the way, you are the truth, you are the life. There is no other way to the Father but by you, and it is through the cup of the blood of Jesus Christ, and we honor it, we remember it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you guys so much for being with us. I encourage you tonight now to just sit around as a family and to continue to worship Jesus and love on him on this Good Friday night. Thank you so much for spending some time with us to lift him up, to celebrate him. And I'm praying for you that now you will walk and run the race from the finish line. Take your victory lap. We love you guys. God bless you. Have an awesome night. His mercy spoke for me, His mercy spoke for me, oh His mercy spoke for me, it was on Galgotha's tree, His death brought me.